bodybuilding is not just a sport. It is a way to live one's life, to reach for that moment of perfect symmetry and dimension. Welcome to the Cult of the Body. Bodybuilding is a tremendous thing when you realize that you have a hand, you have the power to create your body the way you want it. Today on stage, you have to be as big as you can be, as muscular as you can be, as ripped as you can be, and as freaky as you can be. I think that we are a little bit obsessed. Bodybuilding is not body destruction. If anyone thinks that there's no drugs in all sports, they're living in a vacuum. I am 100% drug free. Bodybuilding gives you power, gives you energy. I really respect these guys that go out there and do it naturally because they've really got to pay attention to their diet and their supplements. I'll pick poses that are going to make me look bigger than I really am because that's what this sport is all about, the sport of illusions. I don't want to sound cocky or anything, but I'm going to go out there expecting a win. year, thousands of people from all over the world gather for the ultimate bodybuilding competition, Mr. and Ms. Olympia. The Olympia Expo hawks fitness products and celebrity bodybuilders are on hand to inspire hungry fans. Whether you're a fitness buff or a 98-pound weakling, the Olympia delivers muscle, mass, and mania. This is our Super Bowl bodybuilding and fitness right here. strong willpower, you have to have strong determination, and you must love what you're doing more than almost anything in the world. With the pros, it's a whole other ballgame because you're talking about working with the elite athletes in the world, the best. The guys you see at the Olympia are the top 13 or 14 elite athletes in the sport. And when you qualify for the Olympia, you enter the elite group. You have to feel great, and you have to let everybody see that you know you feel great and that you are great. Backstage at the Olympia, athletes pump blood into their muscles, tan and oil their bodies, all in preparation to show off the quality and size of their physiques. Tanning is really one of the things that they're judged on. You've got to understand they have to be really exaggerated tanning. You know, it's not just a normal tan like you and I have. It has to be really, really dark. It makes them glisten and it really just highlights and defines their physique. So you can just see their definition. <laughs> I'm the last person they see before they go up on stage, so it's very important that I make them look their best. They're presenting that total package, therefore I must make sure every body part is completely in view. If there's too much oil in one spot and not enough on another, it's going to take away from their symmetry. It could do nothing but mess up their body, so all that time, effort, money that they put into their contest could be completely axed. A panel of IFBB judges await the start of competition. We judge them for their muscularity, for their symmetry, and their proportions and their definition. There are seven compulsory poses highlighting arms, legs, abdominals, and back. Each competitor tries to emphasize their strengths and hide their weaknesses. The size in itself won't make you win. The quality of the muscle itself won't make you win. It's a combination with symmetrical development. That's the key. Every part of your body has to be symmetrically developed to the other parts. And they all have to be at their top level. If somebody comes in with a huge, massive chest and massive biceps and shoulders, but they've got weak legs, they're gone. Symmetrical posing is means you show the left and your right side of your body exactly the same way. Then we do a comparison where we put two or three fellows together. That's really where you can really get down to the nitty gritty. Because everybody looks good by herself. At this level, these guys are all champions. So when you see them by themselves, you're going to say, wow, this guy's great, this guy. You put them together next to each other, and that's where you decide who's first, who's second, who's third. What goes on in the pose down, it's a culmination of all three rounds, and it's the athletes trying to outdo one another. So if one guy does a pose, the other guy's saying, look, I can do it better, and he's trying to prove to the judges, I'm better than this guy. The pose down is where the bodybuilder's charisma and confidence shines through. It is a free-for-all, and the audience loves it. The three-time Olympia champion.
champion, Ronnie Coleman. The Olympia purse is $435,000 unevenly split between the men and women. Top prize is $30,000 for the women split between two weight classes. $110,000 for the men, winner takes all. Prize money aside, to win the Olympia is the brass ring that promises product endorsements, guest posings, and supplement support. It really takes discipline to, to make it to the top in anything, and especially bodybuilding, because it's not like the training takes all day, but you're involved with your body all day. Bodybuilding is, is made up of three th stages. One is a competitive sport. Two is a lifestyle. And three is an art. Training begins at the gym. Gold's Gym in Venice Beach, California is considered the mecca of bodybuilding. Whether you are an amateur or a pro, the goal is to become ripped and shredded, to see the physiology and shape of the muscle through the skin. For some people, no matter how hard they train, if they do not have the proper genetics, they will never achieve the desired look. Genetics, you have to have proper skeletal system. They gotta have wide shoulders, gotta have narrow waist, hips. They gotta be in proportion. See, what I'm doing is shoulders or delts. And the reason I wrap the dumbbells with these is because I can't really grip the weight during the course of the exercise because the weight gets pretty heavy on my hands. Bodybuilder Craig Titus has been training for 11 years, eight of which has been geared towards becoming a professional athlete. Because I'm dieting, I'm just uh, burning interstitial fat out of my muscle, shaping my muscle and uh, creating a look that I need for stage rather than trying to build, so I lighten the weight to avoid injury. See, that got heavy. That got heavy as hell. The idea is to sculpt your muscles to fit your skeletal frame, to have the least amount of body fat in proportion to actual muscle size. Heavier weight creates more mass. Less weight with increased repetitions creates more definition. This past year was the biggest I've ever gotten. I was 274, I'm five foot nine. I still have to put another 15 pounds of muscle on. The amateurs, I mean, they're just so hungry because they want to get to where, you know, like the Ronnie Coleman's and the Flex Wheelers and the Chris Cormier's and the Nossers and all these, you know, the guys that they're idolizing in the magazine. Amateur bodybuilder Travis Wojek trains alongside the pros. At age 20, he is just entering the sport on a competitive level as a natural bodybuilder. It's a tough thing coming into the bodybuilding world because everybody tells you what you should be doing. And coming in, especially as an amateur and as a beginner, you have to realize that everybody's an expert. Everybody's an expert on their own body, and you have to find what works good for you. This exercise here is one of the greatest isolation bicep workouts with the elbow against the leg keeps it in a position where it's always tensed. So the veins coming out real nicely here. It means they like this exercise. <laughs> Across town, Stan McQuay starts his day at the gym. Trying to wake up. Like Travis, Stan is a natural bodybuilder. After attaining three black belts in the martial arts, Stan has been building muscle for 10 years. This year, he turns pro. Bodybuilding is definitely growing in the aspect of different types of people. Come on, wake up. Especially now that the natural shows are coming up, you don't have to be a freak anymore and they can see that, hey, we can just take natural supplements and uh, compete. I'm not trying to get big and huge, you know. I try to stay uh, nice and symmetrical, still pleasing to the average person so that when they come to a competition, they can actually say, I'd like to look like that. And it is easily obtainable. Not easily, but it is obtainable. I see definitely a push for natural bodybuilding. I see guys that are training in the gym, they want to look cut, they want to look muscular, but they don't want to look huge. First of all, it's the hardest sport in the world to turn pro at. When you're professional, you can make money at it. And when you're amateur, you don't. Basically, the difference is when you become a professional bodybuilder, you get paid for absolutely everything you do. Photo shoots, magazine covers, endorsements, guest posing seminars, guest speaking, and even your prize money. And in an amateur, you don't get paid prize money. In several weeks, Travis Wojcik and Stan McQuay will be competing in the bodybuilding competition, Muscle Mania. 
Open to amateurs as well as professionals, its distinction is that it is a natural bodybuilding contest. I qualified to become a pro back in May in New York, and uh, I'm entering this competition as a pro. So it's going to be a little bit different, a little more pressure. Uh, now there's money involved, so it's a, a lot more at stake here. Being involved in a sport, you always want to rise to the highest ranks as possible in that sport. That's why you're in it, to rise to the top, to be the best. If I can become a pro being natural without taking the drugs and being healthy and um, inspiring people to be healthy, just wait and see. If that is possible, I will do it. What is perfection? The classic sculpted Michelangelo's David or the Farnese Hercules, the massive, more developed look? As the aesthetics of the body have changed, so have the physiques. Now, bodybuilding has always been dominated by the heavily massive developed physique. Today on stage, you have to be as big as you can be, as muscular as you can be, as ripped as you can be, and as freaky as you can be. You have to be like that, otherwise you're not going to win the competition. I'm the leanest guy to ever win the, the Mr. Olympia contest, especially three times. When I won it, at 5 foot 9, I weighed 190, between 185 and 190. Today in bodybuilding competition, if you're not 250, you're considered thin. When you go to competition like the Mr. Olympia competition, you want to see guys looking freaky. You want to see the bigger guy come out, a 22 and jump. Holy mackerel, look at the bone, bone flexing, rocking the whole stage. People getting fired up, they want to see that. That's what it takes in bodybuilding. People want to see those guys looking so freaky. The audience loves it. And now for the last 16 years, it's been the massive trend. Nobody is concentrating on developing symmetry of proportion, shape, and definition anymore. If you take a bunch of guys, like 20 guys, that weigh 190 pounds, 200 pounds, of beautiful symmetry, you're going to get this. Because people want to see the big guy. They want to get excited to see the huge muscles like a cartoon. Just as the physiques of the body have changed, so has the science of lifting weights. Early on, weightlifters and fitness enthusiasts utilized free weights, commonly called barbells and dumbbells. Machines were developed to replicate weightlifting exercises. They enable people to lift weight with more control and safety. A machine can isolate an individual muscle more completely through a full range of motion. With a free weight, there is room for error because of imperfect form, which can lead to injury. I got a lot of machines because I went through shoulder surgery, which is right after my uh, last Mr. Olympia contest. I couldn't do certain exercises. And so uh, with the machines, I can do them. See, actually, even this lightweight is feeling pretty good. Over time, as technology became more sophisticated, the design of the machines became more muscle-specific. Today, there is no one standard as to what works better to build muscularity, which is why bodybuilders use machines in combination with free weights. Bodybuilding has an interesting history. The start of bodybuilding began in the 1890s with Eugene Sandow, who, by the way, is the model for the Mr. Olympia trophy. He was one of the forerunners of developing the perfect body. He was a more an all-around acrobat, strong man, and performing feats of strength. Next was Steve Reeves in the 50s. And Reeves, in my opinion, was the most proportionate, good-looking bodybuilder of all time. He really had it all. I used to read comic books, like the Incredible Hulk comic books. And then one day I discovered a muscle magazine, Muscle Power, and Dave Drape was on the cover. And I realized that bodybuilders did exist. So then I took it home and I learned about, you know, Mr. America, Mr. Universe, and then I got bitten by the Iron Bug. I started working out when I was 13. The old uh, Charles Atlas thing. I wanted to get muscles. I was skinny, young. I wanted to attract some girls. And I started lifting weights. When I was a kid, I saw a Hercules movie with Steve Reeves. But when I saw that film when I was about 10 years old, I wanted to come home and lift weights. I wanted to look like Steve Reeves. We all need heroes. That's why I'm trying to build heroes, and Arnold, I knew, could be one of them. My relationship with Arnold and him with me is the complete story of my life work. 
I saw pictures of him in Europe. He was strong looking and he was big and bulky. And we were running a Mr. Universe contest in Florida and I invited him to come. And actually he came and participated in the event. He took second next to Frank Zane. And when I saw him on stage and met him, I knew that the man had an iron will, iron determination, wanted to learn badly, and I knew he loved the sport. 1968 for the Mr. Universe when I beat Arnold, I guess that was when I made my mark in bodybuilding. And Arnold, he had just come to America. He was still very young. I think he was only about 21 years old. Couldn't speak much English and was what we call in bodybuilding smooth. He didn't have much definition. I think I was with him for, for a week after the show. I showed him how to pose and how to control his muscles and so forth. And he really greatly improved because he had a lot of muscularity, but he didn't know how to show it. And I said, Arnold, would you want to go to California? If I can send you to the old original gold gym where a lot of our champions were training, you would be in, among them all and you would be able to pick up a lot of the training methods and ideas and so forth. And he said yes. But Joe Weider told me, he says, he thought that Arnold would be the greatest bodybuilder of all time and, and for a long time. He dominated the sport for many years. Arnold did lots for bodybuilding. I'm looking to build a classical looking body such as those the bodybuilders back in the golden era of bodybuilding, back in the 70s, back when Arnold ruled, and of course he still does, his presence is always around. Here in the gym, Gold's Venice, touching the same weights that he has touched, sends a bolt of electricity through your body. I pay $535 for this 350 square foot room, two blocks away from the beach, ten minutes away from Gold's Gym Venice. I get so happy to eat my food. This is my second meal of the day. Already had my rice, this is my chicken. I wake up in the morning, I plop down from the sky rise, grab my burner, and I walk on over into the bathroom. Plug it in, turn it on, come over here. I boil my eggs. I have seven eggs, two whole eggs, and five egg whites. Three, three, six, and seven. Fill up water, put it on the hot burner. And when I hear it boiling and I'm in the shower, I will reach out and turn it off. Like my fireplace. I actually put these pictures together. If someone did not believe that I was natural, they can look at my development as I progressed. There's all my uh, homies at San Diego State. There's me right there, it's my freshman year. I wanted to be a football player. And I loved wrestling as well. The only thing that stopped me was my knees, my injuries. So the only thing that stopped me was myself. I am absolutely living my dream right now. One day I'm gonna wake up and my dream is gonna be a reality. The reason why I got into bodybuilding is it's a long story. It's a little different than most people. When I was growing up in high school, I was hanging around with the wrong, wrong type of guys, um, hanging around with a lot of gang members. I wasn't really deeply into the claiming territory, but you know, we went out if we had to throw down or fight with another crew, we, you know, we did. I grew up, I was a skinny kid. I was very insecure. I would never, you'd never see me walk around with shorts or a tank top on. So. I, I wanted to get in the gym and pump up as much as I could. You know, it took a while before I started seeing some improvements, but once you start seeing the little bulges coming out, you know, it, it just uh, makes you really excited and you just want to keep at it. A lot of my buddies I was actually hanging out with, they were in here also, so it was kind of like a hangout for us. But uh, as I got more into it, you know, a lot of my friends, they weren't interested, so they started leaving, but I just got hooked on it. I had genetics. You know, for bodybuilding, so I kind of steered away from the gang bang and, and got more involved in the sport. This guy's got a great physique right here, definitely. He's got a lot going for him. Just keep working out. Every year I do a little guest appearance at a high school in East LA. They have a little bodybuilding club, and what I'll do is I'll come and I'll do a guest appearance, and I'll do a little spiel about what I did and what I went through. <laughs> All right, let's do this. 
Rippling muscles on male bodybuilders inspire admiration and attract a strong fan base. However, take that same aesthetic and put it on a woman's physique and you have a different story. The world of women's bodybuilding has always been controversial. From the decrease in size of the purse to the increase of the size of the women's physiques, it is a sport that is in transition. The physique of the pro females have changed so much. You would look at a contest that I was in and look at a contest, you know, two years ago and you'd say, this isn't even the same sport. A perfect description is when people find out I'm ex-Miss Olympia, six-time Miss Olympia, and they go, oh, but you don't look like one of those bodybuilders that I see on TV. Corey Everson uh, did probably the most to keep women's bodybuilding popular because she was such a total package. She was good looking, she had a great body, and she was charismatic. And then after that, I think the winners got more and more muscular and they had less of the total package. And now it's got to the point where there's no total package, there's just a lot of freaky muscle. In 1985, I ran the Miss Olympia in New York at the Old Felt Forum. We sold 5,000 seats and had to turn a couple of hundred people away. But as the physiques increased, the attendance dropped. You know, there's the argument that every athlete should be permitted to develop them, uh, themselves to the maximum. But to turn a woman into a man is uh, just a little too much. When I first started out, uh, my strongest body part were my legs. I came from, you know, tumbling background, track background, dance background, so I always had really genetic legs. My father had great legs. From the first time she picked up a weight, two years later she was a pro. My husband, who's my trainer, and I, we worked very, very hard to just bring out that overall package where no body part stood out from another body part. After three years of trying, Kim Chizewski won Ms. Olympia four times in a row. Away from the bodybuilding limelight, Kim Chizewski and her sports nutritionist husband, Chad Nichols, live in Missouri. I am now making a transition to fitness, and it's because basically I've achieved all I could achieve in women's bodybuilding. I had been the big muscular girl for long enough, and I just wanted new challenges. In deciding to take the fitness challenge, Kim has shed at least 55 pounds of muscle in just over a year. To tear down that much tissue, Kim had to cut down on her protein intake, the most important muscle building block. I am a lot happier now that I am trimmed down and can wear normal clothes and off-the-rack clothes instead of having to have everything made for me. It was never that I liked being big. I never liked the off-season where you had to, you know, gain weight in order to lose weight to look a certain way. I had like 11-year layoff of doing no gymnastics, no tumbling at all, and I'm above and beyond at the age of 32 where I was when I was, you know, in college. So this is pretty cool for me. The movement now is with the, uh, with the Miss Fitness Olympia. The popular bias is in favor of a more lean and traditionally feminine look. Where women are judged by more traditional standards like they were in the early 80s. Like, more like a beauty contest. Athletic women that are, are, are beautiful and have good physical development, have definition, are not big, don't do muscular poses and have a lot of flexibility and have some kind of act that they do. The prize money is, is up in the Miss Fitness Olympia compared to the Miss Olympia. That is what's marketable and it seems to be what draws people in and what they want. I think there's a turnaround coming and I think this last year was the year that's going to make this turnaround happen. You know, I think the judges and the public and um, the Weeder magazines, I think everybody is saying, enough is enough. You know, we are going back to what we had 10 years ago. Come on, Lisa. It's funny, looking back on it now and getting that big is like I wasn't looking in the mirror at myself so I couldn't really see how big I was getting. But now looking back and I compare and I'll be like, Lord, I was huge. Professional bodybuilder Lisa Lewis has been referred to as an Amazon. At a height of 5 feet 10, during the off-season, she weighed in at 205 pounds. In competition, her weight was 193 with 3% body fat. I'm 180 now. I like to come in competing at 160. 
the criteria is changing. They don't want the big girls anymore. They want us more defined, more detailed, simplifying our looks. I think the change is good and healthy for the sport, but I don't think that they're realizing that you can't tear the muscle down overnight. Today, bodybuilding is a billion dollar fitness industry. Where did it all begin? The name Weeder is synonymous with fitness and health. Right. Joe Weider is credited as the founder of the modern bodybuilding movement. I always enjoy it. You know, when you love something, you just love something. It grows on you. In 1940, along with his brother Ben, Joe created a self-published newsletter devoted to fitness, Your Physique. When I told my mother I was going to publish a magazine, so I must have been around 17 or so, she thought I was crazy. She says, you can be a publisher. But eventually, we got it all together. It was mimeographed in our own home and put together and brought to the newsstands to be sold. And it got renewals. Buddies subscribed, and it began to build up a little mail order list. And then we started to manufacture barbells and chest expanders and benches. So when I began to sell the barbells, I was making profit. So I took the profit from my magazines and the barbells pulled it together and published better and better magazines. Today it's called Muscle and Fitness. From humble beginnings in Montreal, Canada, their grassroots enterprise has mushroomed into a multi-million dollar empire that provides fitness-related products to over 60 countries throughout the world. This is a billion dollar industry. Most people don't really understand that. Today, the nutrition and supplement industry is thriving. Inspired by bodybuilders, the fitness craze has taken the public by storm. From protein powders to fat burners, vitamins and amino acids, the science of nutrition has become as important as the workout itself. When you get involved in bodybuilding and you want to compete, you learn so much about your body, about every muscle, food, calories, everything. Although it takes years to train, it is the last four months before competition that are the most extreme in terms of nutrition and sacrifice. This is when the dieting begins. Nowadays, people are smarter, too, with competing, where you don't starve yourself of everything. You have little bits of things that to maintain not having to go over the edge and binge. It's an incredible amount of work, and, and it ha they have to get obsessed with themselves in order to do that. They are the masterpiece, so they have to be obsessed with themselves. Everything the bodybuilder ingests is taken into consideration for gaining muscle or losing fat. I'm going to go buy my food for the week since I'm preparing for the muscle mania. Um, Got to eat. The off-season is basically trying to gain as much weight to get as big as you possibly can. So then when you start your pre-contest diet, basically you're dwindling down, trying to save as much muscle, but at the same time you're trying to take off as much fat as you possibly can. Uh, right now I'm looking for some steak. I like to take in some beef about three days a week to keep my calories high. I look for uh, something that's really lean and inexpensive, of course. Um, I usually go through about anywhere from eight to ten breasts a day. Broccoli, three pounds of broccoli. I go through this in about three or four days. I'm eating anywhere between uh, ten to twenty eggs per day. That's egg whites without the yolk. These guys pack on incredible amounts of muscle, and a lot of that is attributed to high protein diet. Bodybuilders can eat in excess of 400 to 500 grams of protein daily. That is six times the normal intake. On top of that, to burn fat, they increase their metabolism by eating six to eight meals a day. When you train, you're breaking down the muscle, and your body will strip amino acids from the muscle. So you've got to take a, a certain amount of protein to kind of counterbalance that. The hope is that you're taking enough protein in as you break down the muscle, that now the muscle is going to rebuild itself bigger. And so everybody that's coming in here day after day after day is breaking down muscle, trying to rebuild it so it's bigger and bigger. When I walk on stage, I will be polished and professional, and my physique will be absolutely complete because of my conditioning. I make sure that I'm absolutely as low in body fat as I can be before I walk on stage. Anybody can come in and train um, and, and lift weights and put on a lot of muscle. But when it comes to bodybuilding and showing what you've done that whole year, if you didn't get your diet down or your nutrition isn't perfect, whatever you've done will never show on stage because of the diet it isn't right on the money. The diet is very expensive. Eating chicken and beef every day, it adds up. And if you don't have sponsors, it's very hard. Food alone is probably in the area of uh, 
six to eight hundred dollars a month. On top of that, all of your supplements, protein powders, your meal replacements, it's going to run you probably somewhere around three, four hundred dollars a month on top of all of your grocery bills. So it's not a cheap sport for sure. Supplements are very important to bodybuilding, whether you're a professional bodybuilder or an amateur just starting out. A lot of the proteins and the nutritional products that are sold in bodybuilding stores, I mean, they're, they're there for a reason because they can actually supplement your diet cheaper and more effectively a lot of times than a meal can. When you work out day after day, there are three basic supplements that are the foundation of building muscle. Protein, glutamine, and creatine. For instance, many of the protein powders contain 20 or 30 grams of protein per serving. Well, your typical chicken breast has between 20 and 25 grams of protein. An egg white only has 3 grams of protein. You have to eat 10 egg whites to get 30 grams of protein. Glutamine acts as a great muscle cell volumizer. And once again, I would definitely recommend it for people wanting to gain or lose. It also acts as a uh, cell detoxifier. Creatine is a tried and proven nutrient that definitely enhances size at the cellular level, meaning it actually pulls fluid into the muscle cell, which is very similar to a steroid, but it's, this is very natural and very safe. Just as important as nutrition and supplements, water plays a huge part in how a bodybuilder can manipulate his training to achieve that ripped and cut look. So your muscle is 70% water, and people forget this while they're training. So we're constantly drinking water. At least I am, anyway. Pre-contests, uh, I usually try to get in about a gallon and a half to two gallons a day of just water. More water in means more water out. It's the best natural diuretic there is. Water is a huge part. You can be very, very lean, between 3 and 5% body fat, but if you've got a little tiny bit of fluid in the subcutaneous layer of your skin, all of a sudden it has like a blur to the, to the muscle. The less water you have in your system and the less fat you have on your body, you'll show more muscular definition. And there's another part to it too. It's called vascularity, where the blood vessel network in parts of the body stands out as well. The goal for most bodybuilders is like you see, like in the gyms, the anatomy chart, wanting to achieve that paper thin look so you can see every individual striation of muscle. Basically, striations are when you flex, you see all the muscle fibers. I would say the last 24, 48 hours up until the show isn't the most healthy part of it, but it's a very short period of time. You go to extremes in preparing for competition like water depletion and uh, extreme low carbohydrate diets and getting very dehydrated. You're going to feel bad. A lot of guys will go 18 to 20 hours with no water whatsoever. What usually ends up happening is they're just drinking so much water, and then when they stop it, they just stop it. If you think you're in the worst shape of your life on stage, what's everybody else going to think? You have to feel good. You have to feel good about yourself, and you have to feel energy. The physical sacrifices that athletes choose to endure can eventually cause permanent damage to their internal organs. Why take the risk? But some bodybuilders take it too far. Because everyone wants to win. Everybody's looking for that little edge. And it's very difficult because if you're slightly off on the day of the competition, you're talking about a whole year's training down the toilet. They can make a difference from fourth place to first place. They would resort to anything, not bodybuilders, everybody, to get to be the best they could be. Anything to be the best? <laughs> to win? The use of steroids in all sports is the dirty little secret that is not so secret anymore. What we do for a living is show off our muscle, and it's uh, obvious what we're doing to get that way. <clears throat> Muscle Mania World Championships, only the best are here. <laughs> Natural bodybuilding enthusiasts have gathered in Anaheim, California for the 10th annual Muscle Mania Natural Bodybuilding Championships. It is the largest drug tested competition in the world. The pro division is very tough. Everyone in here is top quality. It's a huge competition. There's over 200 competitors. It's the most I've ever been in. You know, the sport is definitely growing as far as natural bodybuilding. It's growing big time. Natural bodybuilding is actually, I don't want to say harder because I'll get a lot of pro bodybuilders upset with me, but it's its not easy. I really respect these guys that go out there and do it naturally because they've really got to pay attention to their diet and their supplements. Here with the Muscle Mania, we have an unbelievable caliber of contestants. I'm just here to have fun. My goal is to be an inspirational bodybuilder. 
show others you don't need drugs to be a great bodybuilder. It's just motivating people. Steroid use and bodybuilding, uh, they, I mean, they're always going to go hand in hand. Basically, the breakdown is there's the non-tested shows and there's the tested shows. Non-tested shows, they supposedly do random testing on comp competitors. The IFBB does random steroid testing throughout the year. So at any point in time, you know, an athlete's name can be drawn and, and you've got to report, you've got literally a day to report to a doctor and take a drug test. Hey, you got to just give them your name and wait line. Yeah. All right, got a cup waiting for me. Yeah. My name on it. Yeah. Cool. And then the drug tested shows, they don't have random. It's top five guys get tested automatically. So if you fail, you're out. No questions asked. Horse number 149, is he in there right now? That's me. Is that you? I'm going next. Okay. So there goes. And 151's yes. in there. Thank you. For the Muscle Mania, I am in charge of drug testing. What happens is every competitor that goes on stage for the finals, they're asked to urinate in a cup, and the cup is labeled. We have nurse practitioners on hand to make sure that everything, the person that goes in is the person coming out. They seal them, and they get sent off to a laboratory in San Diego. I think it's great. Yeah. I think yeah, it's good. It's fair. It keeps everybody honest. Yeah. Yeah. But there's some clever people who know how to beat these things. But it's better than not doing anything at all, so I think yeah. I think it's good. If somebody wants to compete naturally, I don't think we have a problem with that. No, not the at all. The same way, but we don't, you know, if they're going to, you know, you know, we don't put them down for being natural. I don't want to be put down for not being natural. But they do. <laughs> but they do. But they do. But they exactly. do, yeah. To me, I'd rather just stay natural in the long run. You know, if you live to be 50, so I won't have to worry about having problems due to steroids. Anabolic steroids, human growth hormones, insulin. Whether organic or synthetic, steroids are based on increasing the levels of the male hormone testosterone to expand muscle density and strip down body fat beyond what normal levels of testosterone will do. If you take small amounts and you're, you're medically supervised, I think that you basically can get stronger and healthier. I mean, steroids are, were developed to help people after surgery gain muscle mass back. And then they figure, well, if a little, a little is good, then a lot more is a lot better. Not, not true. That's when it gets dangerous, is when you take high amounts for long periods of time. We are not drug-free, but neither is any sport. If anyone thinks that there's no drugs in all sports, they're living in a vacuum. Everybody's doing it. That's makes a play, that it makes is, playing yeah. field level. Yeah, ab absolutely. It is a level, play, level playing field. And how are you going to guarantee that nobody does it? You know, we do drug tests. We drug test for substances that we can detect. You know, and you can't detect everything. There's so many things you cannot detect that they don't even have tests for. Any steroid or diuretic is not acceptable. And if for some reason that comes up when the urinalysis is done, the finalist does get boosted out of their position. Thank you. Everybody is using it. It's unfortunate, lady, and I'm the most unhappiest person. I wanted people to live a good, healthy life. You know, I don't know why guys are willing to take that type of risk. I mean, whenever there's money involved, people do crazy things. And when you're talking about the Olympia, that's a lot of money uh, riding, and there's a lot of contracts riding, uh, and, and a lot of people take this sport to heart, you know, and, and they're very serious about this. It's their business. And so this is where the sport has gotten as far as drugs, at the expense of just getting more and more size, more and more hardness. That's the same reason why I'm coming into the sport and staying natural. I've seen 200 bodybuilders come in today, and every single one that went on stage was drug tested. Thank you. There are natural bodybuilders. They are tested. There are organizations now just for natural competitors. So I have full faith that these competitors are natural. Let's go, Zach. All right, all right, all right. Now, we're only teenagers, OK? Teenagers. I'm 19. 19. Well, we're both 19. Now, by the time we hit 25, We'll be looking like these other good guys, but better. Let's do chess. Let's do We're ahead of time, okay? Chess. Muscle Mania is open to men and women, amateurs and pros. The class divisions start with teenage boys and go all the way up through the master's division for men over 40. There are over 200 competitors. Everybody here is really good. Everyone helps each other. That's what's great about it. We're all friends. I don't want to sound cocky or anything, but, you know, at the same time, you got to be confident as well. So 
I mean, I'm going to go out there expecting a win. This weekend, Stan and Travis are competing in their respective classes, professional and amateur junior division. As a pro, Stan has the possibility of walking away with $10,000 in cash and prizes, while Travis, as an amateur, has the glory of the title, which gets him one step closer to turning professional. my biggest fear you've got 40 guys in the show and what they do is they line us up on the side of the stage and there might be a thousand people sitting in the audience looking at us in our underwear basically so you stand there naked in a line with 40 guys and your worst fear is if they never call you out because there's nothing worse than seeing some guy cry backstage and I'm talking literally crying because he worked 16 weeks and never even got a call out and I've seen it happen at the last shows I was in, and it's just never going to happen to me. I can guarantee you that. At Muscle Mania, 200 competitors are narrowed down to the top five in all 14 divisions. The natural bodybuilders go through four rounds of competition, initial class lineup, compulsory poses, symmetry, and finally, the pose down. Last week, everyone and their grandma was trying to give me advice. Oh, Travis, do this, don't do that, don't do this. Travis Wojcik poses down with the amateur junior heavyweight division, young men ages 19 to 22. I've won plenty of times in my life. I know what it's like. This is the first sport that I've got into that's a, a subjective sport. Every competition I come into, I know I can progress more. Because of my age, my muscles are just going to get more and more mature. My skin's get thinner and thinner and thinner. And so I'm looking forward to the future. Travis easily takes the first place win in the junior heavyweight division. The finalists for professional are number two, Mike D'Angelo. The professionals at Muscle Mania are part of an elite class of natural bodybuilders and are invited to compete. Number seven, Stan McQuay. the hardest and most grueling thing when you're on stage. People don't realize how hard it is. I mean, to me, it is the hardest thing. At all. I mean, coming in here and lifting the weights is easy. Doing the dieting is fairly hard, but when it comes time to uh, get on stage and flex and blow all the air out for a good 15 minutes, oh, that's a workout. Well, I'm burned out. I'm tired. I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry for a win. After narrowing down the top five to the final two, the possibility of Stan McQuay winning is 50-50. My goal is to make top five, I took second, so yeah, it was, it's a big, to me it's a win. So I'm excited. It's worth all the hard work, and now I get to go eat. Stan is greeted by his biggest fan club, his mom, dad, and girlfriend, Carolina. Most bodybuilders, the first day after their first contest, they pig out and they eat everything in sight. And I did it. I ordered a 20 ounce porterhouse steak. Here you go. 20 ounce porterhouse. Right. <laughs> I'm ready. You're a lucky man. Bro. We don't eat like this all the time, but every once in a while. When the competition is over, the crowds have all gone home and the diet has been broken. It is just a matter of days before the bodybuilder heads back into the gym to begin the cycle all over again. I really don't know as far as uh, what direction I'm going. You know, I'm still new to the sport. I'm here to make some money just like everyone else. I get to travel around the world and help promote the sport of natural bodybuilding. Bodybuilding is opening people's eyes to what's possible for the body. It sets you up for a training experience the rest of your life. It is a world accepted, a world recognized sport activity. Bodybuilding has completely changed American culture. More gyms are open, more people are training, men, women, 
My dream was to come to California and be a world champion bodybuilder. That's what I wanted more than anything. That's what I'm sitting right now. Bodybuilding is about the process and the technique to take your body and mold it into perfection. Regardless of whether you consider bodybuilding a sport, a lifestyle, or an art form, the bottom line is that to be a bodybuilder, you must have discipline, focus, and an utter belief in yourself.